uh, normally the important criterion of molecular materials is that you make molecules using what are standard synthesis making of covalent bonds and then assemble them into materials using the variety of non-covalent interactions. So this is second point that you have weak interactions which assemble them allows you to also take it back to molecules and reiterate something like a cyclic uh, design iterative way to obtain materials properties of interest by tuning the molecules through assembly, through synthesis and assembly. So this is the versatility of molecular materials, which is not quite the same with the traditional materials like metals and metal oxides and so on. They don't have this high reversibility between the material and the building block uh, of the material. Now, molecular materials have been around for quite a long time, in fact. In uh, the 19th century, the, the liquid crystals were discovered and probably they are one of the most uh, systematically studied molecular materials. But the real boost to this area started in the 1950s by the discovery of semiconduction in organic uh, charge transfer complexes. And this is just a list uh, which is my uh, preferences, but there are a variety of other materials. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but what the, the idea of putting this slide is to impress upon you that all kinds of solid state properties like semiconductivity, superconductivity, luminescence, ferromagnetism, ferroelectricity, all these and nanomaterials, all these have been realized in molecular materials and there is always an interest to go further. And this is one of the, uh, the sustaining uh, goals in our laboratory to look at the new domains, the domains of molecular materials. So today's talk and most of our work has been focused on luminescent materials because they are of interest in displays and sensors and biological probes and so on. But the fundamental problem in this area as far as the materials uh, issue is concerned is that if you take a nicely fluorescent molecule like a rhodamine dye, which shows very strong fluorescence in solution, if you make it into a solid, the fluorescence is completely quenched. This is called self-quenching because of energy transfer processes and so on, which I will briefly touch upon towards the end of this talk. So there is a great interest in getting strong solid state fluorescence, that is strong light emission in the solid state. And therefore, this is intimately related to the way the molecules assemble. And there are a lot of mechanistic issues. And that is where the computational modeling, which is of interest to this workshop, comes in. So I will be touching on this as we go along, but the dominant, the dominant theme would be on the experimental observations of luminescent materials. And one of the prime uh, interests that we have had over the last several years is the issue of uh, crystallinity and amorphous nature. As you know, a crystal is one where you have a translational symmetry. There is a periodicity of organization of atoms or molecules. And an amorphous one is where there is very little or practically no ordering of this kind of translational periodicity. So there are a lot of mo molecular materials which are macromolecule based, polymer based, which show crystallinity and amorphous nature. But among small molecule based materials, which are much easier to work with in some sense, because of solubility and uh, various other uh, advantages, and they have been made into all kinds of materials. Most of them have been crystalline. And we have been asking this question continuously about the importance of amorphous materials. And why this is important is it raises many fundamental issues. For example, beyond the idea of structure and assembly and dimension and size, size of course coming in the, in the new domain of nanomaterials and so on, the question is can crystallinity play a role in tuning the properties of materials? And there is of course a fundamental issue of what is called nucleation and growth models where an amorphous to crystalline change is supposedly an important stage when molecules aggregate and form into crystals. There is an in-between state, which is amorphous, which is increasingly becoming more important. And if you can do this reversibly between amorphous and crystalline, they are known as phase change materials, which are of great interest today, in, uh, not only in uh, uh, energy industry, but also in information industry, a lot of uh, computer um, uh, hardware, for example, RAMs and so on, are made based on phase change materials today. So now the fluorescent signature is also important because normally when you go from a solution to a crystal, 
the fluorescence is known to change as i showed you for rhodamine it goes down but the molecules of interest to us it should go up now the important issue the side the related issue is what about the amorphous state connecting these will there be something in, in between the solution and the crystalline state as a signature of an amorphous nature and can computations reveal some idea about the intermolecular effects and roles of molecular assembly to understand this transition from solution to amorphous to crystal so this leads me to the overview of what i will talk about today i will be talking exclusively about a group of compounds which we have been working on for the last 25 years or so what are called diamino diacetyl cuno dimethane they are particularly easy to make and highly versatile group of molecules and we will briefly run through any question okay various issues of fluorescence in crystals and colloids and langley blodgett films which are monolayer films or multilayer films this amorphous to crystalline transformation and the reversible transformation and the important issue of the aggregation of molecules how they aggregate it is not some random aggregation which is going to help you but very oriented aggregation and how it affects intermolecular channels and intramolecular channels so when the tra energy transfer and how that will uh, impact upon the fluorescence uh, uh, enhancement so i will because of this uh, nature of this workshop i will try to uh, touch upon briefly of course at various points what the com computation helps us how the computation helps us in looking at these experimental observations so starting with this first point so this is the structure of this compound that i was talking about so this is basically a very simple molecule which is highly ionic zwitter ionic i should say with a highly localized charge positive here and negative here and these are easily synthesized the synthesis was first reported in the 60s by a group from dupont in the us this, this is a very well known molecule in organic semiconductors which is commercially available and if you replace these two cyano groups with amino groups which is a very simple one step synthesis or perhaps two step synthesis in occasionally occasional cases you get this molecules which are very strongly donating group here very strongly accepting so we have a highly polar or a dipolar structure which results and the dipolar nature is crucial to all its properties so one of the early experiments we worked on this for a variety of reasons for a long time in the beginning to look at nonlinear optical effects and so on but i will start the story from a uh, more than almost 20 years ago where we started observing very strong fluorescence on some of the compounds various derivatives and so on experiment you can make them but this is the graphical illustration that crystals are highly fluorescent the solution which is around them is practically non fluorescent now this has important applications as we have shown much much later you can use it for imaging of uh, biological cells like uh, leaf cells and so on and later on on bacterial cells we have several applications which we have explored over the years but one of the early experiments that we did using langley blodgett films so that is where you make molecules of this kind which have a hydrophilic and hydrophobic part which can uh, sit on water surface without going inside the water and then you can mechanically compress them into organized monolayers and you monitor that organization of the molecules using what is called a surface pressure area isotherm uh, at a constant temperature you monitor surface pressure as a function of area and this gives you important information about the organization for example using what is called bruce strangle microscopy we could look at the what is the nature of these monolayers as you compress them as you compress these the monolayers they get uh, packed at the low pressures they are the fairly sort of diffuse and you know not very close packed but at this point suddenly the pressure area is sort of changes and you can see some domain formation and so on and this is something that you can observe using microscopy but what is interesting is the the electronic structure of these uh, assemblies which is reflected in the optical absorption spectrum so at low pressures you simply compress them your absorption uh, lobens increases because you are increasing the number density but as that uh, transition happens there is a sudden shift in the peak position from a higher wavelength to a lower wavelength this is a very characteristic shift and it looked like it is some kind of a crystalline packing and how do you understand that is where computation comes in and these are huge molecules to do ab initio calculations on the whole structure so what we do generally is very simple modeling we started doing some simple uh, molecular mechanics uh, methods to optimize the geometry to get the 
rough idea about the molecular structure with these uh, long chains and so on. And then we assemble them in a computer using this so-called the Material Studio program. You can assemble them into monolayers. Basically, we use this space group information purely based on the molecular area derived from the experiments. So we use some kind of a packing, which of course is sort of purely uh, hypothetical, but we try to fit the area per molecule, which is an experimental number, and the height, which is also an experimental number, because we can do, uh, I have skipped that, but I can show you. Or maybe I have removed that slide. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay. So, using atomic force microscopy, you can get the thickness of the film, which is approximately three nanometers. So, we know the thickness of the film. We know the area from the surface area isotherm. So, we can do a modeling just to build clusters or periodic structures of this molecule. Now, why do we need this kind of a model? This is to understand the electronic structure. We take these molecules, of course, truncated to do a little better computation using both the semi empirical, including some configuration interaction, uh, or using some ab initio methods. I think we have also done some uh, density functional calculations. Roughly, they are all giving the, roughly the similar ballpark values. But the important point, as far as the experiments are concerned, is to look at when the molecules are kept far apart at certain distance, so maybe around 15 angstroms or so, which is what you can nicely do in computation. Experimentally, it is not that easy to do. But of course, in the Langmuir blodgett trough, you are mechanically compressing them. So in principle, you are actually changing the intermolecular distances. So at this long distance, if you do a simple computation for the ground state or the excited state, the energy comes out to be 470. Uh, and if you bring them closer to that distance, which I showed you in the packing model, uh, then you can see a large blue shift in the absorption, both at uh, semi-empirical and uh, ab initio level. Uh, then you, it basically tells you that this packing is very important. And in the ab initio, actually what we do is not to use all these molecules because these were too big in those days to do even computation in a, uh, in a workstation. So we use something called a point charge model, which I will elaborate again as we go along how we do, do this in a little more elaborate way in a later example. But we put basically point charges and they, pro they provide a local field which changes the, the oscillator strength and the peak position for these uh, transitions. So you can nicely show that this blue shift arises due to molecular packing. Now, this of course led us to look at you know, fluorescence that was absorption phenomena, but fluorescence at that point, we were not looking at excited states and so on, which we have done later on for other molecules, which I'll discuss. But the important lesson from that language blood this study is that these monolayer films, you can also record fluorescence. And the fluorescence also shows a very nice shift. And we started asking ourselves the question at this point, are they amorphous? And here it becomes crystalline because these kinds of vibrational features come in the fluorescence spectra when you have ordered structures. And there is some fluorescence enhancement and so on, which is very important, which we actually made a story out of. But we will not go into those details at the moment. Now, this was our first experiment in terms of Langmuir blodgett films, which gave us an idea that the molecular packing is very critical and simple computations can provide some qualitative insight into what happens at the molecular assembly level. So we became ambitious to look at this amorphous to crystalline transformation in a more systematic way. So instead of these amphiphiles where we cannot understand the actual packing assembly from an experimental point of view, we started working with smaller molecules. These are actually small molecules, uh, which are again DADQ based, where we can actually grow crystals and do crystal structures of this experimental crystal structure. And this molecule we will simply call it BBPDQ. It's uh, some groups are here, bromo, phenyl and so on. I will show you the full structure maybe in the next slide. What is interesting is if you take the method solution, the peaks are fairly sharp. And in the solid, it's always the case, they broaden. And this, of course, we can easily look at. So this actual molecule here. And the fluorescence, of course, increases strongly when you go from solution to solid, which is what I call the enhancement. And if you normalize spectra, clearly show this blue shift, just like in the absorption, there is also a very visible uh, shift in the fluorescence. In fact, the color itself changes for the fluorescence. This is more greenish, this will be more bluish. And these are the actual experimental numbers and quantum yields and so on. But the, some simple computations which we did in those days, this was done quite a long time ago, is to look at the molecule as a monomer and you can do some DDDFT calculations again 
either in vacuum or with uh, some uh, solvent medium. And you can use the crystal structure geometry or you can optimize it in vacuum or optimize it with a, what is called a self-consistent reaction field method. This is something that we have employed very often uh, to sort of model the molecules as they exist in the crystal. Now, this is a little, uh, it's sort of a very simple modeling, but it works fairly well as you, this picture shows. For example, just look at these numbers here. The twist angle, because these molecules are highly twisted, I forgot to mention this. That is this nitrogen atom here, the blue atom, this carbon, the following carbon, and the carbon here, they are not in a plane. There's a torsion angle between them, which is what we call the twist angle theta. Very critical parameter for this molecule because of the steric hindrance between this ortho hydrogen here and these groups, these things twist enormously. The twist angle is almost 40 degrees in this molecule from crystal structure. If you do simple vacuum, the simple optimization of the molecule in a vacuum, you will get a very completely wrong uh, twist angle and you will get very wrong uh, absorption free energies and so on. But if you simply impose a, a, something like a solvent medium, which is actually we are using a di dielectric constant, which is a tunable parameter here, we choose the, the dielectric constant so that we get the right dihedral angle when we optimize the geometry. And th this is used normally for solution calculation, but we are using it in a way, uh, in a simple model to pick the, the dielectric environment of the molecule in the crystal. Please remember these are highly dipolar molecules, which means there is a strong electrostatic field around the molecule. And we are sort of uh, uh, simulating them using a very, very simple and crude model, which is a continuum uh, solvation model. So, but then you numbers work out very nicely. The dihedral angle comes out very nicely and the absorption peak comes out also very nicely in ag agreement with the uh, crystal structure values and so on. And to look at molecular assembly features, we used to do in those days, so this was some time back, as I mentioned, uh, we looked at dimers and the thorn, which are picked from the crystal, and you can various hydrogen bond dimers, and you can see the absorption peak will sort of spread around to lower uh, wavelengths and higher wavelengths and so on, sort of roughly modeling what happens in the solid state. Because in the solid state, it's not a single molecule anymore. It's a molecule which interacts with all its neighbors. And the fluorescence shift is, of course, is more interesting. So, started probing this experiment. And we let it slowly crystallize. You get beautiful crystals. You can do crystal structure. However, if you do what is called drop casting, that is, you take a dilute solution, put it on a glass plate, let it, let it evaporate quickly without allowing it to solid uh, to crystallize in a very organic way, you get these very spherical looking particles, which is microscopic. And if you look at its absorption spectrum, the absorption spectrum looks almost like a solution spectrum, even though these are solid films and very different crystal. So the important
what's interesting is if you make a broadcast film of this on the on glass and expose it to methanol vapor like we did earlier but there it was never crystallizing but with the slight molecular structure modification it does crystallize over a long period of time in about 45 minutes these are images of uh, electron microscopy you can see these particles becoming bigger and so on and slowly forming a structure and nicely plate like structures of course we have to prove all this using a variety of uh, diffraction and so on all those data are there in this published paper but we will not show all the data experimental data but we can prove that these are amorphous and these are highly crystalline but what what about the electronic spectroscopy and how what does the computation comes because that is of interest to the audience here today so if you simply look at the absorption spectrum solution and the solid there is very little change in this particular case but the fluorescence shows very clear shift solution amorphous particles and uh, the the crystalline solid there is a nice gradual change and what is interesting is as a function of this exposure time that is when you expose it to amorphous uh, sorry to methanol vapor uh, these are the pictures which i showed you earlier you actually have a fluorescence which is tuning at a very low uh, amorphous form the fluorescence is very weak and close to 500 nanometers wavelength which is sort of greenish that is this is the green color of the emission or cyan color as you expose it to methanol vapor over a period of 45 minutes the peak shifts almost to 450 and the fluorescence intensity grows and the color obviously becomes more bluish so this is what we call the fluorescence tuning and uh, this is basically the uh, the relative values of intensity exposure time and so on so forth. now here we try to do some amount of series of computation to look at the because it is an emission tuning which is most important here so how do we understand that and uh, modeling excited state as you are probably already aware other uh, good uh, theoreticians uh, professional theoreticians must have advised you about it it's a tricky business so as an experimentalist we just try to do some whatever is available in the packages and see if we can get some meaningful numbers to understand our experiments so here we started these computations first of course we took this molecule and we optimized as our usual trick with acetonitrile solvation and we can get these dihedral angles reasonably good and we can also get this absorption peak position fairly nicely which is no, nothing new as we have already shown with the previous examples here actually we show the homo and lumo of these molecules which actually tells you the nature of the charge transfer transition because as you remember these molecules are highly zwitterionic they have a positive end here negative end here on excitation this negative charge basically flows towards this positive charge so that is sort of shown the homo is dominantly on this end the lumo has large coefficients on this uh, amino group end and so on and what <coughs> the <coughs> sorry the dipole uh, the, the local field that we place and which we, which i briefly mentioned in the lb films i will elaborate on that a little bit more so what we do at the computation level is the following we take this molecular structure and this is of course the, the molecular geometry from the crystal structure <clears throat> and we do a simple calculation to compute the dipole moment and we get some number 22 d bar as i said because these are highly dipolar molecules they have a large dipole moment now we know this the length of this dipole the dipole is largely in this region because these are phenyl groups which contribute very little to the polarity but most of the charge is on the diaminomethylene and disaminomethylene group. So we take this as the dipole. So we, we sort of model this as a dipole of this length. C7 is carbon 7 here, and this is carbon 8. We take that distance as from the experimental geometry. We know the distance. So knowing the dipole moment and bond length, the dipole length, we can calculate the charge. Because dipole moment is simply the, the charge multiplied by the distance. So this is the number of coulombs that we get and you can convert it into electrons. So you essentially calculate, essentially model the charge on these points as about 0 0.8 plus here and 0 0.8 minus, minus 0 0.8 here. And you, of course, the calculation also gives you the dipole vector. So I can actually place the dipole vector, which is actually parallel to this. This is a computed dipole vector. The, the pink shows the positive and blue, the green shows the negative. End. So this is our model of the molecular dipole. <clears throat> now what we do is to take this molecular geometry from the crystal structure. So this is the crystal structure geometry because all our experiments are done on the solid. So <clears throat> we take the crystal structure geometry and then we take all its neighbors again from crystal structure. So this is important. The experimental 
data is extremely important for all our computation. So crystal structure tells you that uh, the molecule has a large number of neighboring molecules. So we pick the closest dip molecules and model them as simple dipoles. And these dipoles, of course, are these dipoles, the orientations are dictated by the previous slide, which I showed. And there are about four molecules which are coming very close to this dipole. So they exert basically a local electric field on this dipole. Because they have point charges, we don't put any basis functions on them. So only the electronic structure is calculated only for this molecule. But we are mimicking the local dielectric environment of the crystal using an extremely crude model. But it works very nicely because we get all these numbers very nicely. This is the absorption energy, which clearly shows some kind of it. In this particular case, there is a very, very small change in the absorption energy, uh, but not a very significant one. But more interesting thing is the, the fluorescence energy. To do the fluorescence, of course, we, it is a more tricky. I spent actually a lot of time using simple B3 lip 631G star, which is, of course, our standard. Of course, you could make it more fancy with the more uh, uh, diffuse functions and polarization functions and so on, but computation becomes more expensive. And because our molecules are not small, so in fact, we have large diphenyl groups, we truncate them, we fix the geometry because this part, uh, if you let it optimize, it will run into long computation time. But in the solid, we, we don't expect this to, 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 uh, uh, to sort of uh, this dihedral angle to twist too much. Uh, I'll give you a reason for that in a moment. So we fix this dihedral angle, we fix this geometry, this truncate, this large phenyl groups and so on. Then we have a reasonable structure on which we can do computation. B3 uh, with the 631G star gave us very poor numbers. So we started looking for trans excited state better modeling. And I found this uh, CAM model, which is apparently a little better. Uh, that is what literature tells me. And that indeed worked much better for us. Using that, we can actually optimize the excited state geometry. There are some significant uh, geometrical changes, some dihedral twists and so on. But this dihedral angle, if you let it twist, the calculation will run forever and never converge. So we fix this dihedral angle, which is very important. Uh, but we do see some significant changes in this <coughs> uh, benzenoid, quinonoid character and so on, which I will not uh, bore you with. There are some important structural changes in this uh, chromophore unit, which actually affects the electronic structure and electronic states. But just as an aside, why do we fix this angle? Now for this, we did another modeling, which I have not put any slides here, because that is sort of a deviation from what we are talking about right now. <coughs> What we do is we take the molecule in a simple uh, molecular uh, mechanics calculation. We pack around it some 50 neighboring molecules from the crystal lattice structure. So now we have a central molecule surrounded by 40 or 50 neighboring molecules. Now we let this molecule's uh, geometry rotate artificially by just modi modifying this dihedral angle. I can go on calculating the lattice energy. So when this twist starts, what you will see is when this, uh, if I change this angle a little bit out of, say, this is around 30 degree to start with, if I make it 35 or 40 or 45 degree or 25 degree or 20 degree, the lattice energy really shoots up. That is because all these phenyl groups and so on, which are around, will start hitting against the neighboring molecules, which essentially tells us in the crystal lattice, the molecule will not be allowed to twist much. In fact, that is the key to the fluorescence enhancement in these molecules, which I will briefly touch upon towards the end. Now, we did a lot of modeling, which I will not go into detail. We basically take this um, excited state, and just like this, we put this uh, dipole neighbors, and we compute all the excited state uh, um, decay energies, the transition energies, for example. This gives you a summary of them. I will not, we have done a lot more calculations, uh, which uh, I will not go into. Just to impress upon you the nice the model, how it agrees with the experimental observation from emission spectra, the lower part is experimental data, solution, amorphous solid and crystalline solid. So in the solution, if you do this computation for the excited state, we get a reasonably good uh, transition wavelength in good agreement with this. And in the solid, we put dipoles, which are very close to the, the as dictated by the crystal structure at the correct distances. And you can see the nice blue shift in the fluorescence peak, which is observed in the emission. We see that in the computation with dipoles. Now, what about the amorphous solid? That is the most interesting part. For that, what we do is we just systematically vary the dipole position. 
because as I showed you here, sorry, in this picture, we have the molecule, we have these dipoles. So we just keep moving the dipoles, one angstrom, one angstrom, two angstrom, three angstroms, and so on, away, all the four dipoles, which is sort of, again, a very crude model for the amorphization, because what happens in the crystal when it becomes amorphous? The density usually goes down because the packing is weaker, is less rigid. Packing is less rigid means the intermolecular distances are slowly increasing. So that is our hypothesis. So if we start with the no dipoles, uh, that is somewhere here, and if we keep on adding the dipoles closer and closer, or the returning will be moving them away. Uh, so if basically there is a nice uh, uh, sort of redshift of the peak as you remove the dipole, or blue shift as you are increasing the dipole, uh, the closeness of the dipole, the relative to the crystal structure. That means when related crystal structure it is one, you get nicely the, the peak position due to the crystal. As you move the dipoles away, you are basically modeling the amorphous structure. So that sort of gives us some idea about how this fluorescence tuning happens and uh, how this uh, simple computation or this model of a lo local field can give you some insight into this experimental observation. Uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Oops. Okay, I think I will run through the rest. This was the main computational part I wanted to discuss. So the rest I will, pardon me, but sorry. No problem, sir. You can take up the time. Okay. Yeah, another uh, 10 minutes I will quickly go through. This is more of experimental interest, uh, except the last part where we will talk briefly about the intermolecular energy transfer and so on. So as I mentioned, since we looked at the amorphous to crystalline transformation, we wanted to do it reversibly. And it is very important, as I said, these are called phase change materials. And commercially, some materials like this are used in random access memories and so on, where you use a short, uh, high laser pulse uh, to make them amorphous and use long laser pulse to crystallize it back. And these can store a uh, lot of uh, information because where it becomes amorphous, the optical reflectivity becomes low and the electrical resistivity becomes high. And that can be used to read out the return information. And this can be done with nanometer precision. So this is very important commercially. There are commercially available PC ramps that are called phase change based random access memories. And uh, the, our question was, can we make functional molecular materials which are phase change? Because we have been working with these compounds. We did a lot of tuning of these groups, as you can see. After a lot of struggle, we made some kind of peculiar groups here, alkoxy, alkyl groups, and so on, which have a very interesting crystal structure. And we eventually succeeded in doing this reversibly from amorphous to crystalline form using some thermal protocols by heating and cooling and quenching and so on. But this is, of course, the amorphous to crystalline form is done by slow heating and fast heating and quenching will take it back to amorphous. And we can do this reversibly. And what And uh, again, and, uh, again. Sorry, yeah, okay, yeah. I think there is some somebody's mic is on. I'm seeing. Okay, fine, it's better now. So again, here we did the usual thing, which uh, actually we started. This work was done before the other work which I discussed. By using this field of dipoles, by moving them, uh, we can actually model this uh, amorphous to crystalline transformation. Here we did just one shot. There we did a more systematic study, as I already discussed with you. Now. One other small area we went into to look at uh, from a theoretical perspective, a uh, simple computational perspective as well, is the question of this, how these molecules orient and what is the intermolecular effects? And why do we get enhanced fluorescence? In all the previous things that I talked, we are only looking at peak shifts. But what about the intensity? Why do they grow when you make them crystalline? Now, this is a very important problem, which is now there are thousands and thousands of papers in one. that I will describe in the next five minutes tells us is that simple aggregation is often quenching and which everybody knows. Why do in special cases you get fluorescence enhancement? And the key to that is this oriented aggregation. 
and the, the relevance comes from intra and intermolecular channels of excited state DK. So the special importance of this thing we can illustrate using same our series of DADQ compounds. So when you and so on. So in the solution state, it will like go to the excited state and it will twist and it will relax to this some relaxed excited state, which is non-fluorescent. But in the solid, you prevent this. The excited state loses energy not only by changes, but also due to energy transfer. Now, in this molecule, when we get excited state uh, fluorescence, the fluorescence from the excited state, it also means that the intermolecular channels are somehow closed. And that is something that you need to probe and establish. For this, we did a lot of experiments again. We designed a new molecule, a very simple molecule, again has the same core structure. But what was interesting is by doing a very simple tuning of these alkyl groups here, R1 and R2, this is where materials comes, chemistry becomes very interesting. You are just doing the classical organic kind of steric hindrance between them. And it has a very weak solid state enhancement. Solution fluorescence quantum yield, solid state enhancement is only about 30 times. This is the picture of this uh, uh, material in the sort of an amorphous, okay, of this material in the solid state. Very weakly and almost greenish fluorescence. You put one ethyl group, situation changes. There is a larger twist angle, you let large enhancement. You make two methyl groups, there is more steric hindrance, you get a much bigger twist angle, you get much bigger enhancement. So this is basically, we said this must be due to two factors, intramolecular and intramolecular energy transfer. And this, of course, we have to prove using some simple modeling. And we did an extensive amount of computation, which I will not bore you with. State the excited state in the S0 with the ground up to op gem optimized geometry, uh, ground geometry and excited geometry, sorry, ground geometry in the S0 state, S1 state of the ground geometry, and S1 state of excited state geometry, S0 state of excited state geometry. So there are four energy surfaces that we compute. And using all these numbers, we can pretty well uh, sort of show that they are in a reasonably good agreement with the experiment. And the type of lattice energy calculation which I mentioned tells you that in the case of 1A with very little steric hindrance, if you twist this molecule uh, in the, you, you will actually the energy, lattice energy goes up very little. So excited state torsional relaxation is quite possible. So the molecule can twist and the molecule will basically end up in this, uh, in this sort of uh, uh, twisted state. And there is be very weak uh, fluorescence coming out of it because these molecule, these energy states are too close and they lose energy thermally. So you get very little fluorescence. But what is interesting, more important challenging problem is 1B and 1C both show that the excited state rotations are, are practically impossible. The energy will go up tremendously, lattice energy. That means the excited state torsional relaxation is impossible in both cases. Then the important, the problem becomes more challenging now. 1B and 1C both cannot rotate, so both should have been highly fluorescent. But as I showed in the data earlier, the 1B and 1C, the enhancement are very, very different. 1A, 1B becomes enhanced reasonably well. 1C enhances extremely well, almost 1,000 times. Now, what is that due to? That, we believe, has to do with energy transfer. And there's a lot of literature on this, concentration quenching effect, what happens when you bring molecules close to each other. There are two important mechanisms people call Forster and Dexter. This is a dipole-dipole interaction. This is an overlap of wave function interaction, which um, causes energy transfer between molecules. So we took all these three molecules because we have experimental geometries, the crystal structure and so on for all the three. You can see the twists are very different in the three cases. And these are the packing of the molecules. Now what we do is we look at their possibility of intermolecular energy transfer. 
and we use both uh, Dexter and Forster uh, models in a very crude model. We just look at the molecular dipoles. As I already said, these molecules can be modeled as dipoles. So we take these dipoles here, neighboring dipoles, neighboring dipoles here, neighboring dipoles here, and you can nicely see between this 1B and 1C, the structure immediately tells us some very interesting things. Here the molecules are very close because of some hydrogen bonding and they are pretty flat and almost packed nicely. Here, because the molecules are more twisted, they cannot pack so well, they become almost orthogonal. These two molecules, if you look at, are very orthogonal. These two are quite far apart. That means the distance becomes far and the dihedral angles, the angle between the molecules will become also very um, highly modified. Now you can quantify them by putting them all into this equation. You can model the Forster using a very simple model like this, looking at the dipole-dipole distance, orientation of the dipole with respect to each other and with respect to the center to center, center to center vector. Dexter you can model by looking at the molecular planes, the dihedral angles between them, the slip between the molecules and so on, which are all experimental data. So we come up with a relative energy transfer rate. What it shows is that 1A, there's a large energy transfer by both Forster and Dexter models, but 1B it is less and 1C it is practically little. In fact, the Dexter mode is almost nil. Even Forster is very weak. So this gives us a very nice in, uh, insight into the reason why there is a large fluorescence, large energy transfer means very poor, very large, sorry, very poor, decreasing energy transfer means increasing fluorescence response. Because here the energy doesn't get transferred, they come out as fluorescence or light emission. So this is the broad model which we arrived at using all these models. In torsional relaxation, possible in 1A and it quenches the fluorescence. Fluorescence is enhanced in these two. Energy transfer is very high, high here, less here, and even less here. Leads to fluorescence enhancement. So instead of calling it aggregation induced enhancement, we call it orientation aggregation induced enhancement. Uh, I think I, I have skipped the last part because of the time factor. We can do this in uh, the stewarding of fluorescence in a variety of other ways. Briefly, I mentioned earlier in the context of those amorphous to crystalline transition. So I will summarize here because I think I've exactly taken 40 minutes. So I've talked about this fluorescent signature, importance of oriented aggregation and tuning this thing through this, uh, uh, this uh, sort of hierarchy of flu the amorphous nature. So these are the various students, many of them graduated and left. This guy is still around, Ritesh is still working on some of the related problems. Actually one more student I forgot to add here, working on similar things, just joined. These are some of the facilities, and I thank you for your attention. Very much thank you, sir, for delivering us an excellent talk. As a, it was very, very informative. Uh, let me first open the eyes for the question. Participants. Yeah. The if question from the participant mm -hmm. side. Uh, sir, I just have some few uh, inquiries over here. Like, uh, yeah. you mentioned that when you synthesize or when you prepare the dye in its solid form, you observe the blue shift. And with the blue shift, as far as I know, there is a, a kind of a H aggregation, if I'm not wrong. And H aggregates are generally fluorescent quenched. But you were observing a very high fluorescence when you move from uh, solution phase to the solid phase. I mean, yeah. was there any mechanism behind it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this is not simple H aggregation as you have seen. See, H aggregation is simply a sort of a side by side uh, backing. Uh, and H aggregation quenches again due to energy transfer and the exciton states, new states are created. And the transition energy oscillator strength goes down. But as you can see here, it is not simply uh, an exciton which is relevant here. The energy transfer, intermolecular, see, H, the H aggregates again look at this as uh, dimer models or aggregate models. Right. We are not looking at the energy transfer issues there. So, if you take an isolated molecule related to a dimer or an H aggregate, there will be some uh, quenching if it is H or uh, if it is J, there will be an enhancement and so on. And there will be red or blue shifts accordingly. These systems, we are looking at a local electric field effect, and which is much more complex than simple H aggregate as, as situation. And that is one reason. Another is, in the H aggregate, we assume the geometry of the molecule is unchanged in the ground right. and excited state. And in the 
these systems in solution, there is always quenching. And that is to do with the molecular geometry changes in the excited state. When you excite them, they start, start twisting and that quenches. In the solid state, that is prevented. And the H aggregation effect will probably quench, as you said correctly. But the intramolecular, that is an that becomes the pathway for the emission. So you get enhanced fluorescence because you are closing the intramolecular energy loss pathway. Correct, correct. Yeah, this is a point, sir. Uh, sir, I have a second question. I'll not take more time. Uh, the second question is. Uh, you mentioned that you try to mimic the emission behavior computationally and for that uh, you took some different distances between the two molecules and then uh, uh, calculated the S1 and S0 energy. So over there, my question is just a second. Sorry, so the last query? Yeah, my query is like uh, you varied the distance between or your research group has varied the distance between the monomeric part. But what about the angle part? Because as far as I know, when the angle between the two monomeric units, keeping them at a fixed distance, it changes. Again, the fluorescence and the energy level, they dramatically change. Absolutely, so any, absolutely. Any yeah. effect you got observed yeah. over there? Yeah, see, in that particular study, we did not look at all this angle part, which we started looking in the last example that I gave you, where we actually show that the dexter pathway is strongly affected by the intermolecular angles, the, the angle between the planes of the molecule, the angle between the dipoles and so on. So those are more interesting for the fluorescence uh, problem. The one which I mentioned in the LB film in the very beginning, it was simply uh, molecules are fixed by the interface there. So the, the, the interface between the water and the air is the, the dominant force. And we believe the molecules are fixed by their that interface. Of course, there is no proof, but as you compress them, we are primarily moving the molecules closer and closer. Mm -hmm. Now, you, as you correctly said, they can be twisting quite possible but with it with the crude model that we have in the simply based on molecular area we find that even if the molecule twist the area of the per molecule will not change what changes is the intermolecular see the molecule whether it sits like this or like this the area on the surface occupied by the molecule is roughly the same so lb experiment is not sensitive to this organization changes and the peak shift Primarily, it seems to be due to the local field. The fluorescence quantum yields will primarily be affected by the orientations. Your point is peak shifts. Is it primarily due to the local electric field? So the, if we are modeling it as a dipole, we cannot actually put in the intermolecular angle at all because we are taking point charges. You got the point? Right, sir. You, you took it as a point charge, so that is why the angle yeah. angles are considered okay. Yeah. Certainly, a better model you had you can bring in by putting molecules at different angles and see what is the subtle effect of it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. that is what we do in our research. Definitely. And Definitely. In yes. our, uh, yeah. group. So, that time I used to play around with all these slippage angles. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. No, no, they will uh, have subtle effects. There is no doubt. Great. So, with that, I'll thank uh, somebody, sir for his yeah. Somebody put a question. Uh, let me try to answer, uh, explain the logic behind avoiding diffuse functions. Okay. No, no, there is no logic in avoiding. It is just that, you know, computational time goes up. And uh, in principle, you know, we are not really uh, theoreticians. We spend the minimum time possible on the computation and spend more time on the experiment. So once with the 631 D star works to a reasonable extent, we stop with that. You can always make it more sophisticated by adding. That's what I said by making a better basis set, going for better electron correlation and so on. We are only showing a model and numbers I'm sure can be improved by doing better computation. Right. Second question is, is there any effect of the solvent on luminescence properties? Um, yeah, in the solution spectra, of course, there is very strong solvent effect, what is called solvetochromism. And usual solvetochromism is, you know, you will, uh, have usually some kind of a uh, thing, simple donor acceptor substituted molecules will have a positive solvetochromism. But here we have highly dipolar ground state, so you actually end up seeing a negative solvetochromism. When you go to more polar solvent, they blue shift. This is exactly what happens in the crystal also. But most of the, our interest has been in the solid, but once the solid is formed, all this history is gone. Now we are only looking at the solid, but we, as I mentioned, 
we effectively model the environment of a molecule in the crystal using solvation models. Uh, third question is uh, how do you change the dipole position computationally to obtain the graph? Okay. That is simply by moving these uh, dipoles because in things like Gauss view, uh, you have an option to, to, you have a molecular structure, I have these point charges, I can actually type the distance and that will physically move. Or in the Z matrix, if you write, it's of course a little more tedious to do uh, if you don't have a graphic support, but you can simply define a certain distance R and make it uh, go through some steps to do a series of calculations where you step it from say three angstroms to 3.5 or 2.5. And it's pretty easy to do. If you will use I'm the doing a particular energy surface, yeah. Yeah, we will be learning. I'll be training them for okay, this. Okay, very good, very good, yeah. What is the ground state S1 and the excited state S0? No, no, ground state is usually called S0 and the excited state S1. Okay, this is just a standard photochemistry terminology. Uh, S is the singlet. So this refers to singlet spin states. So S0 means usually the ground electronic state, which is a singlet. And S1 is the first excited state singlet. And uh, you can have S2, S3 and so on. In the computation, you will get as many oh, states as you can exactly. calculate uh, based on your computation. You ask for say 20 excited states, it will calculate 20 states. Yeah, it will all the way to triplet, everything it will calculate. Uh, in the plot, the GS1, the question is that GS1 means I can calculate these electronic states for a given geometry. That means GS1 means I have an optimized ground state geometry. I fix Correct. the geometry, do an S calculation of all the excited states. And I excited state. I call it that the ES1 state because with the new geometry, I can repeat the, the what is called the TDDFT calculation is done. So you get the ground S0, S1, S2, S3 corresponding to the new geometry. Those energies are obviously different. So these are usually in photochemistry. Okay. So Yes, yeah. I'll answer it like the way this is a vibrationally relaxed state, which Sir has talked about. So the right. excited states were optimized, and then finally we got the vibrationally relaxed but electronically excited state. Uh, sir, want to infer like this? Sir. So yeah. with that, I'll thank Sir for joining us the session and delivering a very informative session. Uh, I think the question part is over, uh, Sir. Uh, uh, I we are done with the lecture, and uh, now we can uh, terminate the session. Terminate the session. Okay, I'll sign uh, off then. Yeah. I'll, I'll thank on behalf of all the faculty members sure. who are over here, students, for delivering us specifically. I like the way the phase change materials, because this was pretty new to me. I never worked on this system. The phase change material and how they are related to the device fabrication, specifically in uh, the memory based system. So, this is what we are looking for, and maybe we'll implement in the near future. Thank you very much for every. Uh, thank thank you, all of you. Anybody has any further questions, please uh, email me. I'll be happy to try and answer if I know. Yeah, you can, you email it to me as well, and I'll forward it to. Yeah. yeah. And all the charity questions you can forward it to Dr. Agarwal. <laughs> <So, laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Guys, just give me a two minutes. So I hope everybody would have enjoyed the today's session. Like uh, see in the yes, I'll just conclude uh, the today's session. See, yesterday we had a discussion about uh, how to change the molecular structure, how to uh, add certain functionalities, functional groups, so that we can have a controlled lipid layer structure. And why we wanted to have a controlled lipid layer structure? Because those extremophiles of the snail cheese crystals, uh, they essentially change their lipid or biomembrane structure to uh, adapt according to the atmosphere. Today we had a discussion about similar way. You have to change the molecular structure by making a certain chemical substitution and device them for OLEDs, OPVs, uh, phase change materials, and so on and so on. Uh, I hope the content would be clear to all of you. And uh, in the today's session, Sir has briefly discussed about uh, the homo, lumo, 
electronic transition, oscillator strength. So those things we are going to cover up in our today's training part. So be with us. Uh, we'll join back in 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, we'll start in 10 minutes. You can take a relax. Meanwhile, I'll save the recording and then we'll proceed. Uh, please use the Gmate link, on, the same link only to join for the Gaussian training. Don't go for any uh, Zoom or anything else. See you over here. 